This episode is brought to you by KPMG Risk Services. KPMG believes that when you've earned the trust of all your stakeholders, that's when your business has a solid platform to grow. That's the trusted imperative. KPMG Risk Services develop and put in place dynamic risk strategies designed to help your business earn that all-important trust. Go to read.kpmg.us slash trust to learn more. Welcome to Theodora Speaks. Thank you for sitting down with me today. I want to take you down the path of authenticity. So go and grab your favorite drink, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a glass of wine, and sit back and listen in this episode where we discuss living life with purpose and without regret. With Melissa Barrett, Vice President at Visa Inc., who is a seasoned product executive in risk and identity while focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I asked Melissa to be a guest on my podcast because of her impressive 30-year career at Visa, as well as her passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how she consciously incorporates DE&I into both her personal and professional lives. Melissa has a career in risk management, and I resonate with that because I personally experienced identity theft a few years ago, and it was an awful experience. I felt violated. The thief was able to get a decent amount of my personal information. And at the end of the day, I was able to remedy the situation, but not without blood, sweat, tears, and time. Over a year to be exact. Due to the nature of the theft, it took that long to clear up the issue with the company that did not believe it was identity theft in the first place because of how much of my personal information the thief was able to capture to make an expensive purchase from this company. Needless to say, I'm very, very conscientious about my identity today and protecting it. And I will not be using that company's service nor products in the future due to the lack of customer experience and service they provided. Additionally, diversity and inclusion are near and dear to my heart. And that's the other reason why I asked Melissa to be with me today because I'm building a community for women in tech to take risks to reinvent their professional lives. I also work with corporations and universities with respect to advising them on gender inclusion. Visit gailkeller.org for more information. Melissa is vivacious, authentic, and charismatic, and she has a great voice too. Listen for when Melissa says, you can't have diversity without inclusion. Today, we will cover topics from risk-taking in both your personal and professional life, to tips to proactively avoiding identity theft and fraud, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're a woman who amplifies authenticity. So before we begin, sit back and imagine yourself on BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit, traveling with your family to a giant baseball game. You look up and above your seat, you see the following advertisement about yourself. Generously authentic, created by your friend and colleague, Anne Ewing, Vice President, Risk and Authentication Products at Visa. When I asked Anne why those words described your very essence, Melissa, she said in her own words, those words together or separate define Melissa for me. She's one of the most kind-hearted people I know. She's unapologetic for who she is, and it's always encouraged me and others to be the same. She is kind, thoughtful, and present. She will always make the time for you, go to bat for you, and at the same time tell you when you're wrong. What I admire most about Melissa is her positive outlook and passion for doing the right thing. She's been such an amazing mentor and inspiration for me, and I'm so grateful that I can call her my friend. Oh my gosh, that is so awesome. And, you know, Anne is like one of my favorite people. Um, We have had the pleasure of working together and knowing each other for many years. I will take the credit for actually having hired her uh, at Visa. So, Melissa, why is authenticity so important to you? You know, I think authenticity and, you know, why it's important is it, it is the very 
person you are, right? So if if you're not authentic, and I'm not saying I've always been authentic, um, I think you you go through life kind of in like you're living some somebody else's life or you're you're driving somebody else's car. You know what I mean? It just it's not quite the same. Um, and I think when you have authenticity, you actually have empowered yourself to take control and be really intentional about what you want in life and how you want to get there. So you've had an impressive career in risk management. You began your career at Visa nearly 30 years ago, answering their phones at night. Share with the listeners your professional background and why Visa has been the place you've chosen to have a blossoming career. Yeah, it's so interesting because never in my in my thousands of years would I have thought I would be at a company for 30 years. Um, but I will tell you, my career started out, uh, I was a collector at Citibank and worked there for seven years um, and ended up taking a, you know, I would take a temp job. I took a temp job at Visa, uh, answering the switchboard telephone, uh, at night, as you mentioned. And, you know, prior to that, I worked at Wells Fargo in the branch. And so I had some banking background. I kind of understood all a lot of the regulation, um, spent a lot of time on the credit risk side of the house and um, ended up at Visa answering those switchboard telephones just as a second job, just to make some extra money. And it turned out I was being paid more at Visa as a temp than I was at Citibank, and I had worked there all that time. So I was like, why am I, why am I doing that? <laughs> so um, a position opened up. I applied for for a job at Visa, um, having, you know, answered those phones. And, you know, it was a data capture job where, um, you know, we were building merchant profiles and helping retailers close out their batches, you know, way back when. <laughs> um, and so I ended up uh, getting a position at Visa. Um, they were really focused on bankruptcy at the time. Bankruptcy filings were going up. So it kind of engaged some of the credit risk background that I had. Um, which would then kind of move into fraud risk and some other components. Um, but I've always had kind of a risk focus. Um, and I think, you know, risk becomes one of those places where you never want to be surprised. And I think most people, you know, in their careers or in their lives, they don't want to be surprised. <laughs> Um, and so if you can manage your risk in a way that allows you to live your life the way you want to live it, then risk just becomes part of your equation. Do you consider yourself a risk taker? I do not consider myself a risk taker. And I'm sure my, my family would probably tell you I am not. I am one of two children. Uh, my mother was a nurse. My mom, I mean, my father was a an executive at Xerox for many years and then became his own entrepreneur. And so for me, you know, I was always kind of the stable one of, you know, between me and my sister, I, you know, kind of, I would stay in a job. I would, you know, kind of do certain things and she might decide to go off and do something else. Um, but I was kind of this, that steady one. And I think everybody always looked at me as the steady one. Uh, but for me, it was all about kind of figuring out really what I wanted to do. My father kind of instilled this whole philanthropy component. Um, and so I was always interested in getting involved in, you know, the community and trying to just figure out, you know, what else there is and what, uh, we could be doing and how I can, you know, really achieve what I want to achieve in life, you know, and I think, you know, what you want to achieve today versus what you thought you wanted to achieve 20 years ago probably has changed, but it's okay. You can just make the change, pivot and keep going. Pivot. Absolutely. So what kind of philanthropies <laughs> are you passionate about, Melissa? What's nice is at Visa and, you know, I didn't go into a lot of the detail about what I do at Visa. But I actually had the opportunity to do philanthropy 
as part of my job at Visa, when we were working on a lot of the bankruptcy components, we spent a lot of time focused on financial education. What could we do uh, even now to help people and make sure that they are using credit wisely, that they understand finances? How can we help, you know, really create make the economies thrive, right? Mm -hmm. Philanthropy has always been part of who I am, uh, whether I'm in my local community, serving on a board, um, you know, I'm part of a number of organizations. Um, I've served on boards uh, with the things that I've done at Visa for the American Bankruptcy Institute, uh, for the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, um, as an advisory council member. Uh, and I still sit on the board of Balance, which um, is focused on smart money coaching and financial education. Um, and those, you know, from a nonprofit perspective, really trying to focus on how do we deliver education to the communities that need it the most. Um, and so I've always been kind of focused. I've had this financial component. And now with diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, the finances are still in there, right? So yeah, that's wonderful that you can marry the two and have a profession in two things that you care deeply about. So looking back yes. over your career, what advice would you give your 20 something self back when you were answering the phones before voicemail was a thing? <laughs> You're right. There was no voicemail back then. Um, you know, I probably would tell myself, um, plan your fun first. Um, enjoy the journey. Um, you know, live without regret. And, you know, when you learn better, you do better. Mm -hmm. So don't get caught up in all the details. A lot of the details, you know, the devil is in the details, but... You can manage the details if you if you're just willing to to dive in, but I think you know enjoying the journey. A lot of times, especially when you're a young mother, you just want to get the day over with <laughs> <laughs> and try to get to the next one because there's so much to do in a day. And for me, I feel like I skipped a lot of that because it was like you know I commuted two and a half three hours each way. Um, and so, you know, by the time you get home and get something to eat, you know, make sure everybody's bathed, mm -hmm. it's, you know, time to start all over again. So, um, you know, enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Great advice. My, uh, goddaughter's in college. She might be switching majors. And she said, you know, I was in this one major, but it didn't excite me when I thought about that's how I'm going to earn my paycheck. And I said, yeah, you've got to listen to your heart, you know, and, and your gut, because yes. we work for a long time, so we've got to like it, to love it. Well, and you know what's interesting is I think when you think about a company and you think about growing with the company, or even if you start with a company and you're a C-level executive, you know, when you're an analyst, you're thinking about your individual performance, right? Mm -hmm. But when you become, when you grow with the company, when you become an executive, it's not just about how you perform, it's about how the company performs. And so there needs to be an alignment between your personal and professional career. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think you end up always being inauthentic because you're not quite at the table when you're, you know, working at your career. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, what you do has to align with your values. Absolutely. Absolutely. So along your journey, did you have any mentors, coaches that would advise you along the way of your 30 years? And how did they help you if so? Oh my gosh, yes. I can't even begin to tell you. I think the one thing that I, I learned so many things from my father, one of them being, you know, you can get advice from lots of different perspectives. Um, and, you know, I remember being in high school and talking about a personal board of directors. And for me, that was like, oh, okay, I can understand that because then it gives you, you know, people to tap into, um, to really ask questions and, and get answers that allow you to make the decisions that you wanna make. My father was that for sure for me, 
But when I started growing up and getting to an age where he would give me advice and I would be like, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not sure that's the way I, I want to go. I knew I needed to kind of tap into um, some other people as well mm -hmm. to get other perspectives. Um, so it, it became kind of one of those things where you start creating friendships, you start networking. And we were a family that moved every 18 months till I think I was like 13 years old. So I learned how to just strike up conversation, talk to people, be okay with, you know, being somebody in the room that nobody was talking to and taking the initiative. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting um, journey. But I think the the challenge is always with, you know, understanding what do you really want? And the people that you tap into, uh, mentors, advocates, sponsors, I have had so many of them at Visa that are still very close friends. Um, you know, whether they still work there or not, um, they have helped me along the way. Um, you know, one specifically, um, is now in Europe, but um, still kind of looking afar and making sure that um, I have the advice and guidance that I need uh, to navigate through the, you know, the politics in some cases. Mm -hmm. when, I, I think that's great. And it's so important to have mentorship throughout your, you know, Absolutely. one's entire career reinvention. One of the things that I tell people when they first come to work, wherever they're going to work, you know, get some coffee chats on the calendar, make a lot of friends and really just help, you know, and, and don't just focus on where you're working, um, you know, which organization you're in, make sure you break out and find diverse perspectives all over the place. Mm -hmm. That's such an important tip, especially if you're going to stay within the organization and grow. That doesn't mean you might stay in the same division you're in today, for example. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody thinks vertically. They're like, hey, I want to be the president of the company. But the horizontal component is significant when you're talking about educating yourself on, you know, how a company works and how things get done. Mm hmm. I don't know if Visa is anything like this, Melissa, but when I was at Microsoft, so it was so important to do vertical moves as well as climbing the ladder to be diversified so you understand the company as a whole and all the, the solution sets and everything that the company touches. And I think that that was such a great lesson for me to learn that you don't have to keep just having a bigger title. You can make some moves that are horizontal and be happy and still Absolutely. grow and climb the ladder. Yeah. No, definitely. It's, it's amazing how, you know, when you think about rounding out your knowledge mm -hmm. about things, when you think about diversity, you know, there's so many different ways that you get diverse perspectives. Um, so absolutely, definitely reach out. Yes, yes. So we'll get into diversity, equity, and inclusion in a minute. But I'd be remiss not to ask you a little bit about, you know, what you do, the fraud, the identity theft. So looking at how people combat fraud in a digital age, I was reading something recently where companies spend tens of millions of dollars on resolving and protecting not only themselves, but their customers. And then the customers spend at least 15 hours resolving the issue. And I'm a victim yes. of identity theft. And it just felt oh, no. violating. And yes. luckily I'm talking to you now on the other side of it, but during it, it was blood, sweat, tears, and time to get it resolved. So much so yeah. that I have so many um, fraud protections in place today. It's hard to tell when I apply for a credit card that it's really me. So Right. Yes. Right. Yes. You prevent yourself from applying. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Well, sometimes that's not always a bad thing, right? So, right. Um, but, you know, I think it, becoming a victim of identity theft and account fraud is, is really violating, right? Um, and fraudsters and criminals can be very sophisticated in how they access information. Um, so it's really important that, you know, pe people be diligent about, you know, how they manage the information, your personal information, whether it's digitally or, you know, on paper. 
Um, and so a lot of the things, you know, uh, selfless plug, I, I did, um, just finish, um, you know, authoring a book last year with two other authors, one from Experian and, um, one from, um, uh, credit, car, credit card.com. Um, and the credit repair kit for dummies has a lot of great information in it on, you know, identity theft, who you should call, how to deal with it creating your recovery plan um, because it is a lot of time. Um, It used to be a lot worse, I would say, but Mm -hmm. unfortunately, because there's so many people that have become victims, um, it is a little bit more productive in terms of, you know, how to clean it up. Um, But it it, it is very violating. And so I always tell people, I encourage everyone to sign up for text messaging. When you make a purchase, you want to get a text message. That is probably the quickest way to understand whether you uh, become a victim. Um, And if somebody is calling you talking about a particular account that you've never heard of, um, you want to take action as quickly as possible. You want to call the bureau, you want to call the police, you want to call um, you know, the, the, uh, the financial institution that, um, perhaps it happened with. Um, and so depending on what your situation is, you know, there's lots of information available by the FTC, the fair trade, Mm -hmm. federal trade commission. They have great information, free resources, um, all around identity theft. Um, and so you'll learn about, you know, credit freezes and, and fraud, alerts and blocks and things that you probably don't want to know about. But at the end of the day, um, if you have a purchase on your, on your card or on your, in your bank account, or whether you're a victim of tax fraud, just make sure that you're paying attention to how that information, um, is being used and ask questions. If people are asking you for your information, like, how are you protecting it? What, what are you going to do with it? Why do you need it? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that we need to really take care of our own personal brand mm-hmm. as we, um, you know, kind of journey through life. Absolutely. So speaking of education, congratulations on your book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. I had never written a book before and, you know, Steve Bucci gave me a call and was like, hey, you want to help out? And I was like, I don't even know what that means. (laughs) But it was it was really fun. I had an opportunity. He really gave me an opportunity to, um, you know, focus on, you know, several chapters. But one specifically was kind of uh, just all me trying to figure out how to explain, you know, diversity and in credit and, you know, things like redlining and, and things that, um, you know, people may not understand the history of why things are the way they are. Um, and that can be challenging if you don't know the history because you're operating at a deficit in terms of understanding somebody else's journey. Um, and so just trying to provide information to people so that they, they get educated and create an awareness of, you know, kind of somebody else's journey versus, you know, yours. It's -hmm. it's likely very different. Melissa, if there was one chapter that we had to read out of the book, which chapter would you recommend? Well, I would have to say chapter 19, but really all the chapters are fantastic. It's, It's not necessarily a book you may read cover to cover. You can read it that way. But there's also a lot of resources in there where, you know, like I said, if you're a victim of identity theft, pick up the book and read the specific chapter on identity theft, right? So, Awesome. So you mentioned the pandemic that we've all uh, lived and become stronger for it. Tell us how the global pandemic crisis reshaped your career. Yeah, so that's an interesting story because I think I was already in a a real process. Um, my husband passed away. Um, mm. Now it's been about four years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. And 
you know, I think when you're married to somebody for 25 years, <laughs> it really shakes your core because you become this couple. You're identified as a couple, you work as a couple, as a team, and then you realize like that's no longer there. So it was really kind of a journey within myself. Um, and I took um, a few years, um, Visa had sponsored me to go through a an executive program and it was a fantastic, phenomenal program that really talked about, you know, just trying to figure out how to, how do you get to the next level? What's required of you? And it was so timely for me because it was one of the things that I, I, I relied on those tools to get myself out of bed some days. Mm. Um, and so it was, it was kind of a journey, but I also found myself and said, Hey, you know what? I need some coaching. So I decided I was going to get a coach. I went through a process that really kind of helped me ask the questions. Cause I was, I don't even know that I knew what questions I should be asking of myself because I was looking through that same prism that I always had been looking through. And so it became a process. I, I, Went, had one coach, then I went to another coach and it all centered around intention for me. And so when the pandemic hit, for me, it was like, I really wanted to be intentional about where I was spending my time, what I was doing and what I wanted to do with my life for the next five or 10 years. Um, and so the pandemic actually really accelerated that process for me. And one of the things my coach kept talking about, cause I was like, well, it's probably not a good time to like start my own business and, you know, get out there. Um, and he was like, you know, it's absolutely the right time. People need the gifts that you're trying to give and you need to do it sooner rather than later. Um, so I just decided, okay, this is, this is the time. And, you know, after the book came out, I was like, I think in 2021, I need to be real intentional about what I want to do with my time and how I want to live my life. Um, and so I decided I was going to move on. And, you know, instead of doing my day job, which I also was doing, um, you know, I was doing a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work kind of off the side of the desk. And... Mm -hmm. Um, I just said, you know, my passion was really about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And literally people could see my entire demeanor changing mm. the energy associated with a discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion versus something else, you know? And so I said, you know, like, why do I want to live in a place where I'm not totally energized and excited and feeling like there's and a social impact that I want to make. So going back to diversity, equity, and inclusion, you're one of the founding sponsors of the Global Sponsors for Blacks at Visa, if I got the title right. Uh, well, it, you know, the, the names and titles, I have been there a long time, put it that way. I tend to be the dinosaur in the room. Um, and so I was around before we had affinity groups and employee resource groups and um, Black Executive Council and, you know, all of those things. Um, but I ha I did, I have um, sponsored the group um, for many years. I, I was sponsoring the group. So, um, yeah, it's been a journey, um, you know, inside just, you know, trying to understand diversity, equity, and inclusion, create the awareness that you want. Um, and the, a lot of the activities around um, to make sure people understand and have, you know, some understanding. Right. And I think it's everybody has their own definition. Right. And, and do we nail it every time? I don't think so. I still think it's a journey, but it's that inclusion part to me that's so important. Absolutely. Yeah. You can have diversity without inclusion, but you can't have inclusion without diversity. That's right. That's right. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. I got to remember that one, Melissa. So we talked about your ethnic background in a previous conversation. 
and yeah. how you've been misunderstood because people look at you and they call you black, but you lead with Hispanic black. So tell us how that well, misunderstanding has <clears throat> led to being understood. I don't, well, and I don't know that, um, I don't know that I lead with one or the other. I, mm. it, to me, they're, they, they both exist. One is not better than the other, or it's just who I am. Um, and I think people will likely constantly misunderstand because I think people are always looking to put somebody in a box. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, oh, she's black or she's this or she's that, you know, or she's a she, right? Or whatever. Um, and I think, I think a lot of times we spend too much time trying to figure out what somebody is or what ethnicity they are but we don't engage in order to create the conversation and the dialogue to actually get to know someone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the, the, the point of, you know, just being able to be more than one thing, people are very unique. I'm not just a woman. I'm not just black. I'm not just Hispanic. I'm all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And more and more. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, I think we just need to be, you know, when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, a lot of times we spend a lot of time talking about ethnicity or gender, um, but we are multiple things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because we have things in common, we have differences as well. And that should complement all of the things we're doing, whether it be at work or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, Melissa. And you just sparked something in me. You know what you just said, when we hire people, right, for the job, it's not a check the box activity just because that's a gender or an ethnicity. They have to be the right person for the job. And I think we're Absolutely. missing that mark, right, when we yes. talk about this. And so we have to be very thoughtful because you said earlier in the beginning of our conversation, right, your personal brand. It's about you and the role, but you also represent the company. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are some of the positive diversity, equity, and inclusion trends you're seeing at Visa today and in society over the last mm, year and a half? Well, and I'll talk, um, let me talk a little bit broadly um, when I talk about, you know, some of the trends, because I think they are, they're interesting trends. Um, and I think in some cases, you know, you get really optimistic about change that is occurring, um, which is good. I mean, I think some of the great trends that I'm seeing are, guess what? It's a global conversation. Like people are having these conversations everywhere, not yeah. just in the U.S., not just in California, right. everywhere. I'm applauding you. Yes. Um, and that's, that is phenomenal, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I'm finding is, we are making it a priority. They're having the conversations in the C-suite. Funding is being captured. They are measuring success and trying to figure out how to measure it. Maybe they don't always, you know, people don't always get it right the first time, but trying to understand what is the impact and how do we manage it internally and what are the activities we need to be doing to actually move the needle. Um, you know, creating awareness, the learning and training that's going on mm -hmm. uh, that's related to unconscious bias. People have a much better awareness now, hopefully, and they will continue mm -hmm. um, when they're learning and you know educating themselves um, on new topics that maybe they're not familiar. And now they have an understanding that their journey isn't the only journey or the history book they read isn't the only history book, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, just being able to provide more insight um, from all the different cultures uh, provides such a, a more significant creative process for people, especially when you're thinking about innovation and what customers need and consumers are looking for. All of those things become really important. We have to be learn-it-alls and not know-it-alls. Absolutely. Great way to say that. Um, and so I just, you know, I decided that was the way to go. And, you know, thankfully, my manager called and, you know, I was telling her what I was thinking about doing. And she said, maybe we should think about a sabbatical. 
and really redefine a new role. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, sometimes you never know what happens until you take the risk and yes. you decide you want to do something else. And I will say probably a year and a half before I just made that decision, I was making smaller decisions that completely took me out of my comfort zone. And I had just decided, you know what? I'm just going to start saying yes to some things that totally freak me out. Like what? Like writing a book. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to do that. And it was like, okay, let's do it. Um, you know, it, there were, there were so many things where even if it was, you know, I'm speaking and you know, I'm speaking about myself. It's a lot easier for me if I'm talking about some level of expertise or some product that we might be delivering. But when I'm talking about myself, it's always like, I don't want to talk about myself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and I started just putting myself out there and you know, it, you realize it's okay to be uncomfortable. Absolutely. That's also yeah. part of growth, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Melissa, as we wrap today, why is attitude so important as to how one should show up at work? So attitude is so important. Well, first of all, nobody wants to be around somebody who's, you know, not in a positive way. I mean, I think it's hard. It's hard to listen to complaints over and over and over again without getting sucked into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like having a positive energy, a place of peace where you can go, um, provides light to everyone else. And everybody wants to be around light and engagement. And, you know, you, know, you can have moments of time or, or, you know, times that you are maybe not feeling great and you need to go off and do something, but the positivity Cre attracts people. It is, it allows people to engage at a level that they never would if you were being negative. Mm -hmm. And so for me, positivity is just, you know, attitude makes such a difference. And when you have the right attitude, you literally have the ability to empower yourself to take the risks that you want to take and to do the things you want to do without regret. I mean, for me, that's like, that's what life you want to live, right? So. Living your life with purpose and authenticity. Melissa, thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you for having me, Gail. Thank you to Melissa Barrett for sharing her motivational story with us. A special thank you to her friend and colleague, Ann Ewing, for helping celebrate Melissa. And a sincere thank you to you, our valued listeners, and to New Voice Studios for producing our podcast series. The three key takeaways that you need to take away from today's conversation as you sipped your favorite drink are one, choose a career you'll have fun with. And two, Live life with intention and no regrets. And lastly, to have success with diversity, equity, and inclusion, you need to be learning and aware. Be a learn-it-all and not a know-it-all. That's what Microsoft taught me. In closing, please visit gailkeller.org for more information on how I empower corporations and universities with respect to gender inclusion and women in tech with respect to taking risks in their professional lives to reinvent themselves via a personal transformation, to live life more fulfilled and balanced. Thank you and stay courageous. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.